Hello, and welcome to the What is a Literature Review? Practical Steps for Understanding the Process Skill Builder session. This session will help you to understand what constitutes a literature review and how to conceptualize the process. A future installment will review how to write a literature review. Hello, Audrey. Are you there? Yes, sorry. <laughs> you're good. OK, um, I'm going to record, but as long as you're muted, it won't see you. Um, and feel free to interject, interject, or ask any questions or anything that doesn't seem clear. Sound OK? Yeah, that sounds good. Thank okay. you. Um, so welcome to the What is the Literature Review? Practical Steps for Understanding the Process skill builder session. The session will help you to understand what constitutes a literature review and how to conceptualize the process. A future installment will review how to write a literature review. So again, today we're going to focus on what is, how to get your head around it. If you're interested in a recording of this session or any of the other skill builder sessions, there is a site where those are at. It's uh, libguides.agnescott edu forward slash skill builders everything here is posted so uh, a video and then the powerpoint slides that we use and anything else that's been done previously are all located on here so as this series builds out in the future you'll see uh, the whole series dealing with literature reviews done here okay so definition i'm going to read this and then i'm going to break it down this is a very formal definition. A literature review surveys books, scholarly articles, and any other sources relevant to a particular issue, area of research, or theory, and by so doing, provides a description, summary, and critical evaluation of these works in relation to the research problem being investigated. Literature reviews are designed to provide an overview of sources you have explored while researching a particular topic and to demonstrate to your readers how your research fits within a larger field of study. Uh, some important things here when it talks about surveys, books, scholarly articles, and other sources. Usually, a literature review is not going to include opinion pieces. It's not going to include magazine or newspaper articles, though those may be reputable. They're not academic. They're not scholarly. Uh, other sources may include gray or white papers, which are written by um, NGOs or think tanks and have some degree of credibility. Um, and then where it talks about, and, and then it has to be relevant, right? It has to have something to do with the topic that you're researching, although it may be contextual in some way. It may be specific. It may be more, oh, well, I think this has something to do with the topic under review, but it may not seem as obvious to others as it does to you. Um, and then... And we're going to talk about this more, but it says are designed to provide an overview of sources you have explored while researching a particular topic. When it says overview, and we're going to clarify this, we have to make sure that we understand the difference between summarizing and synthesizing. So it's not just a summary of the source. It's more about synthesis. But again, we'll talk more about that. Um, and ultimately, you're looking for how the literature that does exist, how you can expand on that or how you can make that fit into this wider um, research that's being done in this field. Are there any questions about that definition? Nope. Okay. This I hear quite often, oftentimes when the students ask to do a literature review and they ask a question, uh, they ask about it, uh, or when I ask them about it, they'll say, oh, an annotated bibliography. And I say, oh, no, 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 a literature review is not an annotated bibliography. So let's kind of go through this. A bibliography, which I'm sure everyone's written a bibliography, is a list of works, usually it's books, articles, films, uh, could be from a website or something like that. It's a list of works on a particular topic. But as you know, a bibliography or a work cited or a reference page, it just lists everything that you use within the paper. It doesn't add any kind of text. There's no clarification. There's no uh, summary, there's no analysis, you're just listing the sources. So that's the most basic. 
Next is annotated bibliography, which most students have been asked to do before. And that usually includes about a paragraph for each citation. And it's basically to help the reader understand why you're going to use the source, how it contributes to the overall research that you're doing. Um, it may also have some point of analysis. You may engage with the top with, with the resource as to whether it is um, useful or not, or how it's useful, or even if you think there's some shortcomings with the resource. But in an annotated bibliography, you treat each source separately. So there really is no synthesis. It's just a summary of each. And again, some involve more depth, some involve more analysis or scrutiny. But usually it's just going to be, here's the source, here's what it's about, here's how I'm going to use it. A literature review, on the other hand, provides an overview and examination of academic literature related to a specific topic, much like the uh, definition we just gave. And you're going to include the strengths and weaknesses of the author's arguments and findings. So you may agree with certain things and you may disagree, or you may find that this author failed to mention a certain point or overlooked something else within their analysis. You're reading it very critically um, and you're looking for how you can apply it to your own research. But oftentimes, what it may be is that you find you have, say, three different researchers, and you find that one is a, approaching it in one way, another person's approaching it another way, and then the third person is approaching it even differently. But they're all talking about the same topic, the same idea, even the same theory. What you're doing is trying to find something there that you can expand on or use to apply to your own research. Um, so, yeah, you're making connections. Uh, and then you're applying it to your topic, drawing conclusions. This is really important. Your goal is to determine what research has already been done and then where there are gaps. So for example, if two different authors are talking about poverty in the United States and one is addressing um, homelessness, and the other person is addressing lack of vocational training. You may say, oh, well, I think I'm not finding literature that talks about how the two are combined. So that's my gap. So you're looking for what exists and then what is not being presented or is there something here that people aren't combining in some way? Um, opportunities for further research. Again, that's what you can expand on here. What is missing from the sources you have collected? Again, that's that gap. And whether additional sources are needed. Again, that's very important. You may find from your literature review, if there's something you're not finding, uh, you still want to make sure that you're not just saying, oh, it doesn't exist. And usually the term that's used is snowballing. When you know when you make a snowball and you keep compacting snow together until you get it to the right size, and then you throw it at uh, a friend. Um, when it comes to literature reviews, you're snowballing it until you have enough literature to supply, uh, to understand what's being um, researched in that field and how it's being applied and presented. But if you if it's inadequate, if you don't do enough research and you present a gap that doesn't really exist because you didn't really fully research uh, the existing literature on that topic, then you're going to have someone else come in and say, well, wait a minute, you didn't, there's literature that addresses this, you just didn't find it. So that's where you're gonna to wanna to talk to your professor, a librarian, friends, usually I would say all three of those, to look at, oh, what else do you know about this topic? What else, how can you help me find these additional resources? Um, are there keywords I'm not using? Are there places I'm not looking? So any questions about the difference between a bibliography, an annotated bibliography, and a literature review? Obviously, we're gonna focus a whole lot more on the literature review. So we're just going to getting the bibliography and the annotated bibliography aside. And then also, as far as where this fits with a research paper, a literature review sometimes is a part of a research paper, which you'll be asked to do. But oftentimes when you're writing a, a research paper, you're using the sources as a foundation to write about, but you're not treating the sources separately like you would in a literature review. So just understand that when you write a research paper, unless you're explicitly asked to write a, write a literature review, usually you don't have to. They'll, your professor will tell you whether they want one or not. Okay, importance of a good literature review. So it's more than a recap of sources. If it was just a recap of sources and just summarizing things, you might as well write an annotated bibliography, which nothing wrong with an annotated bibliography, but that's pretty much usually what that is, a recap of sources. 
what a good literature review does is it combines both summary and synthesis. So a summary is a recap of the important information found in the source. It's, hey, here's the important points. Here's what's being presented. When it says summary, it doesn't mean summarizing every point in the article or the book or whatever the argument may be. It's more so what is most important. Otherwise, you're going to be writing long summaries that are going to take up a lot of room and you won't have any room left for your paper itself. Synthesis reorganizes or reshuffles that information in a way that informs how you're planning to investigate a research problem. And we'll look at some examples. But again, that's where you're saying kind of what I referred to earlier. You have author A, author B, author C. You're looking at where they agree, disagree, um, where you can expand on their ideas. But by synthesize, that means you're bringing them together. You're comparing them. This idea of reshuffling them is that whereas one author may argue that this is the beginning point and another author, author may argue, oh, no, this is another beginning point to say a problem they're diagnosing, you may say, oh, no, actually, it's the other way around. And again, we'll look at some examples. But just understand, summary has a place, but synthesis also has a place. And I would argue without the synthesis, you don't really have a literature review. Okay, what is the purpose of a literature review? And we've kind of already touched on this, so uh, forgive me for if I'm restating this. The purpose of literature review is to provide a review of writings on the given topic in order to establish the reviewer's own position in the existing field of scholarship on that topic. So it's what literature already exists. It could be theories, it could be studies, um, hypothesis, thesis, it's, it's those types of ideas. And then it's so that you can frame your own research in what already exists. And I think this is really important. In a literature review, you're letting those authors present their ideas, let them speak. And you're doing so that you can show how you're going to add to that field of scholarship. What additional insight, analysis, findings do you have? Because obviously, if you're writing a paper, you don't want to just summarize what someone else has said, you want to take that research and then you want to expand on it and then find something new. Usually it's referred to as the gap in the literature, something that hasn't been done before. And it doesn't mean it has to be revolutionary. You don't have to you know, reinvent the wheel, but you will find oftentimes with research that you'll, you'll be looking and you'll say, well, wait a minute, what about this or what about that? And I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, I think it was two years ago, there was a student taking the religious um, studies senior seminar, and she was looking at the idea of ex-gay, which if you're not familiar, ex-gay is a movement wherein people who identified as being gay previously go through um, a kind of mental treatment, wherein afterwards they are deemed to be cured of their homosexuality. So that's called ex-gay. So when we're talking about it, the student was telling me, oh, you know, there's all this literature and there's all these um, stories and firsthand accounts and literature and that from people who are male and ex-gay. And I said, oh, okay, well, wait a minute. What, what kind of literature is there on women who prescribe to this idea of being ex-gay? And she said, oh, actually, I'm not finding any literature about women who identify as ex-gay. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. That's your gap. If all the existing literature talks about men who are identified as ex-gay or even now have, have uh, distanced themselves from that or are even critical of it, and if it's there's nothing or very little there about women, is it because religion try uh, religion attempts to um, is, is it make it harder for women to come out? Um, is it that women um, don't go through this treatment as often? So there's these gaps there. So right away in talking about it, and you might think to yourself, well, wait a minute, somebody should have diagnosed that already. And again, this was a couple of years ago. Maybe someone at this point has diagnosed that problem. But at that point, no one had, and that was the student's gap. And that's where they were going to add to the existing literature. Here's some things under here. A literature review shows readers where the reviewer is entering the academic conversation or a particular topic in the context of existing, existing scholarship. Again, this is what's already been written. Um, it could be to place each work in the context of its contribution to understand the research problem being studied. 
Now there again, it's each work is, and that's where the synthesis comes into play, is saying, oh, okay, well, this work contributes to this idea. This other work also uh, feeds into this idea. And then it may be that there's other ideas that are separate that still in some way contribute to this idea. But you're definitely treating each work in how it contributes. You're treating them separately. Uh, to some degree. And then describe the relationship of each work to the others under consideration. I think of this as a conversation. How are the different sources agreeing, disagreeing, um, not discussing something, discussing something? I almost think of this as it's like when you're talking to someone and they're leaving pieces of information out and then you talk to someone else and they add to the conversation, but they, maybe they leave something out. You put all these things together and then you have the whole story. That's kind of how I think of it. Uh, identify new ways to interpret prior research. Again, this could be if you are someone, you're reading this and you have an identity that's separate from these authors or you've lived experiences that they haven't, you, that may be a way of identifying new ways to interpret the prior research. There's always something new you can do with it. Uh, we've talked about gaps. Um, resolving conflicts among seemingly contradictory previous studies. You may find that, oh, well, on the surface, these studies disagree. However, I actually think that there's some degree of agreement. It's just they weren't looking at it in the same way I'm going to look at it. So even though there can be conflicts and disagreements, sometimes you may actually find that what seemingly disagrees actually complements one another. Um, and you so if you have two authors and they argue exactly the same thing, it's perfectly fine to say, you know, author A and author B argue this and basically say it's the same thing. You want to be careful, though, of duplication. You don't need 10 sources that tell you exactly the same thing, although it's probably unlikely that you would find that being an undergraduate, but it's possible. Um, again, we talked about additional research. And again, as it says, very important there, locate your own research within the context of existing research. The whole point of a literature review is you're laying out what's been written and then you're looking at what you can con contribute, what you can add that is new. That's, you want them to lay that foundation and then you want to add to that foundation. But if you're basically, if your literature review is essentially, um, a summary of everything that's been written and you really have nothing new to add, I would refocus my research question. And I would ask, hmm, if I can't really contribute something here after doing this literature review, then is this really what I should be doing? But that also could be conversations with others where you may think that something's obvious or something's been spoken about or studied and you actually find that, oh, no, it hasn't. Okay, not in this way. Types examples of literature reviews, I won't go through all of these, but for undergraduates, I think it's super important to understand. You are often going to see literature reviews that are aimed at PhD um, dissertations, sometimes at a master's degree. It is understood that as an undergraduate, you are not writing a 250 page PhD dissertation. So when you're looking at those examples, just they're great for helping you with structure and ideas, but do not get overwhelmed or unduly stressed by them because that is not what you're writing. Also, you want to check with your professor to see what type of literature review that they want you to complete. There's different types. The one that we're going to talk about is the one that's usually done by undergraduates, whether it's in the sciences, social sciences, or humanities, but always check with them. I have also found sometimes um, the term literature review is used when actually an annotated bibliography is being requested. So I would ask about the format there, but I wouldn't get too worried because the chances of you as an undergraduate being asked to write um, a literature review that's beyond some of the basic models is highly unlikely. And this is from Williams College. It's Literature Review, a uh, self-guided tutorial, which is a really good resource. But basically, they list some of these, and I will share this with everybody, so you'll have this and you'll have these uh, this slideshow. But basically, a really good thing to do is to look at publications in your field. Now, again, these are going to be written by people with a PhD, so understand that. <laughs> That is not exactly what you're being asked to do as an undergraduate. However, when you look at these, it will give you an idea 
of how it's written in that discipline and what you should look for. Because honestly, there is no template. Like if you were asking about how to write an antibiography, I could give you effectively a template and say, this is exactly how you write one. With the literature review, there's different kinds, there's different ways of approaching it. There is no template. There is no, do it exactly this way in this order. There's suggestions, there's ideas, there's lots of examples. The examples are the best way to go about it, but there is not an exact template. But these just give you a, a different, idea like this is a protracted war for order police violence in the 20th century united states this is a historiography so it's similar to literature review but it's not exactly literature review but basically you're going through how the topic has been covered through time so basically you would be going chronologically from earlier sources to newer sources you're not going to find that as often and then the rest of these are more traditional literature reviews you'll also find that in journals Oftentimes the literature review, they, they may title it a review of the literature or something like that, but oftentimes it's just going to come at the, towards the beginning, usually after the introduction, and you're going to see the author running through literature talking about um, what's been written that's applicable to what they're writing about. Some, but again, sometimes it says literature review, sometimes it doesn't, but you'll always see that section after the introduction. Nobody would put a literature review anywhere else. So the kind that normally you're going to be writing, it would be a traditional or a narrative literature review. And that's a comprehensive, critical, and objective analysis of the current knowledge on a topic. So comprehensive is, as I said, as an undergraduate, you're probably not going to collect everything that's ever been written on that topic, but it should be comprehensive, especially if there are leading authors in your field and you fail to mention them, that is going to be a, a huge stop sign, a huge glaring omission that you want to watch for, because there are going to be people who are preeminent in that area that you have to mention. Critical, again, that's where you get into not summarizing, but synthesizing. Are you really engaging with that literature? Are you looking at maybe where you disagree, where you agree, where this author is in agreement or disagreement or adds to or detracts from someone else's argument? And then objective is, it's fine for you in your literature review, especially as you're transitioning to the rest of your paper, to talk about where, where this literature may fall short or where you're going to fill in these gaps. However, if you use, if you basically make judgments like, oh, this author doesn't know what they're talking about, or this article is stupid, and I, I know you wouldn't do that, but that is not going to do any good. So if you're writing about something and an author is presenting an idea and you want to incorporate it, but you don't agree with the idea fundamentally because of your own belief system, but you still know that it's an important point to make, you can't just say, I'm going to dismiss this because I don't agree with the person. Rather, you have to acknowledge that person's point, and then you can point to problems with it. Perhaps they are not uh, including all demographics that are affected by whatever it is they're writing about. Like you can do that, but you just can't, you can't just say, ah, this sucks. That's subjective and it's going to tell the reader that you're not really incorporating all signs. Um, and then you're looking for patterns and trends in the literature. So if you read 10 articles about the same topic and you find that seven of them agree that this is the problem, that's a pattern. Or if the trend is finding that, oh, well, increasingly this is happening, A is affecting B, and you're finding that in the literature, then that's a trend. You want patterns and trends. That's what you're really looking for so that you can group these things. Uh, so again, you can identify the gaps or inconsistencies in a body of knowledge. And then from that, you should be able to have a focused research question. It's not a problem to have a research question before you begin your literature review, but your research question, just like your thesis or hypothesis, probably is going to change some according to what you're finding, because you may find that what you thought was the result or the um, cause is incorrect. So just, again, make sure there that you let the literature tell you what's going on. And then again, look for gaps. If you come up with your research question and then you stick to that research question and you don't let the literature inform 
what you're writing about, that is a, a huge problem. Also, it can lead students to just negate or eliminate literature that they just don't like. And it's like, oh, don't do that. I can drive a truck through that and I'll be able to, as a reader, say, well, wait a minute, what about this, this, and this? You can't just negate it because you don't agree with it. You can find other ways to deal with it, but you can't just eliminate it. Uh, a general literature review. So that provides a review of the most important and critical aspects of the current knowledge of the topic. Again, this is going to be the one that you will probably end up doing. Um, and as I say, when, when it's saying thesis or dissertation, just think of yours is probably going to be an extended research paper. The theoretical liter literature review, that examines how theory shapes or frames research. So basically, you would be looking at these theoretical constructs in the literature and then how they're presented. You probably wouldn't do one that's just a theoretical literature review, but there may be theory that you include in your literature review. And then a methodological literature review, that's where you're looking at how the person conducted the study and then what the strengths and weaknesses are. That would probably be more something like in the sciences where you may say, oh, well, people were trying to diagnose this problem. And so they were had this methodology. So this number of study participants underwent these kinds of tests. Again, you probably wouldn't be doing something like that, but that's what that refers to. And then a historical literature review, which we referred to before, is where you're basically, it's kind of a chronological. You're looking at how the issue has been uh, covered and dealt with over time. Again, that one I don't see very often. It is possible. You may think too, oh, historical literature review, that must refer to history papers. It doesn't. It can be done in other disciplines too. And then lastly, what I want to do is look at an example of a literature review, because I've talked about all these concepts. Now I want to show you, OK, what does one look like? And again, in future sessions, there's going to be another session about synthesis, synthesis versus summary. So um, Amani from the CWS will go through and talk about just that concept, because I only talked about it briefly. And then the CWS is going to do another session on um, how to actually write a literature review, which will go into the nuts and bolts. This is more just the about. And then we'll also have another session with Casey Long that I'll be dealing with finding sources. So this is a sample paper. Uh, it was adapted here from this source. And you can see here they're using APA citation. And again, this gives you a brief overview of what a literature review is. So as you scroll down, I'm going to go through real quick. This literature review is roughly three and a half pages with references. Um, for an undergraduate, you never know. Your, your, your supervisor, your super, I'm sorry, your professor may ask you for a one-page literature review, or they may ask you for a 10-page literature review. Make sure and ask them how long they want that literature to, review to be and roughly how many sources they want. They, they're probably not going to tell you I want exactly 10 sources, but they may say, oh, I want around 10 sources, or I want it to be around six pages. You want to ask that because how much information you include, especially the summary part, oftentimes it's tied to how long the literature review is. If it's only a page, you can imagine your summary is going to be pretty short. If it's 10 pages and you're being asked to use 10 sources, honestly, you're going to have a lot more summary in there, which I think at that point, you probably want to clarify, do you want a literature review or do you want an annotated bibliography? So when you're looking at this, we'll kind of go through this real quick. This is your introduction. So this is you're identifying the topic and you're giving just a, a, a broader overview about the literature that touches on this. You can see here, this is using APA. So you've got author and then year. They're not giving you a summary. They're saying like this, the overall rate for EA, uh, which is emergence agitation in children is in the range of 10% to 67%. And then they're citing the author. They're not telling you everything that this article is about. Rather, they're just saying, okay, this is the piece of information that's most important for you to understand. And I'm citing it. And then they're going on, which includes a period of severe restlessness, disorientation, and or inconsolable crying during anesthesia emergence. They use this author 
to define it. So I think what they probably found here is like, oh, these statistics are really helpful. However, I like this person's definition better. And obviously they paraphrased and put it in their own words. So they have both. So what they did was this is a this is an example of synthesis. They took this person's stats, they took this person's definition, they synthesized those to present the information. When I see something like this, I understand then that the student knows how to look at different sources and synthesize, bring that information together. Hugely important. Also, another thing you're going to notice in a literature review is you will see very little to no quote quoting. Now, you may quote a few words or uh, a small section of a sentence or something like that, but literature reviews really should not include quoted sentences, uh, especially multiple sentences. What that exhibits is that the student doesn't really know how to paraphrase, how to turn this in to words um, that connect to their own learning or understanding or analysis. And then you can see here too with this one, additionally, the incidence of EA may be affected by individual variations in developmental level within an age group, mental disease, or neurological conditions. Here, what they're saying is that all, let's see, one, two, three, all three of those authors make that connection. They do not disagree about this. Therefore, I'm going to cite all of those authors. So you may have one author for something, and you may have multiple authors. Now, if one of these authors disagree that the incidence of EA may be affected by individual variations in developmental level within an age group, mental disease, or neurological conditions, if one of these authors did not agree with this statement, I cannot include them. But in this case, they did. And then in, the, in you're going to each section, you're going to wrap it up. This is just a very short, um, I should say, I'm sorry, now each section you're going to wrap it up. In this first part, you're going to tell me effectively what is the thesis of your literature review? What are you trying to prove? And I think up here, you notice they use a literature review as a subtitle. I wouldn't use it as the title. Down here, they refer to it as a literature review, which is perfectly fine. And within your literature review, usually you're going to have different groupings of literature. So what they've done with here is you use a subheader. So you've got your main header and then down here it's like oh this is this part is a component of this bigger literature review. And as you can see, they run through same thing they're noting these authors. And you notice here everything is from that author, these are all the authors ideas what they're presenting and what they understand. And then you can see at the bottom again, I've got a thesis statement here, so I'm separating it. And you can see here is talking about synthesis. That's what I want my literature review. I want a short summary of what the work is about and then synthesis where I'm tying these different sources together. I'm showing connections. I'm having some kind of dialogue or communication. And then at the bottom here, this is kind of my um, takeaway. What's, what's, what's my big, like how am I going to use this literature? And then my conclusion it's where I'm wrapping it up. What is all this saying? How am I going to apply it? The conclusion here, as it says here, should be rather succinct. It's about a paragraph. Remember, you have your whole paper to actually show the evidence, actually discuss what the literature is referring to. This is more of an overview. And this is, think of this, the conclusion almost as a transition into what you're going to write about. And then from there, you'll get into the body of your paper and you'll start to show how this literature applies to your evidence about what you're going to try to prove. Let's go back here. And then the last thing I wanted to show you, this is from Williams College. And it's a literature review, a self-guided tour. Obviously, we're going to have these workshops and work through these things. This is also really helpful. There's videos and things like that, too, for if you just want to do something that's self-paced or to reinforce some of what I've talked about or what others will talk about in the future. Because I would argue, unfortunately, with a literature review, as I said, there isn't really a template. So I can show you examples and I can talk about what it is. But ultimately, it's doing that will be most helpful. Are there any questions or comments or insights?
And I'm guessing no. Okay. Um, thanks, everyone. And this will be up on the Scale Builders site with the um, PowerPoint, which will go into all kinds of examples that should be helpful to in the next week. So thank you so much for joining and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.